the AMA Motorcycle Hall of Fame proudly welcomes John Kosinski. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome John Kosinski. Presenting the AMA Motorcycle Hall of Fame ring tonight is the man who played a fundamental role in capturing 17 world road racing titles, Hall of Fame member Nobby Clark. John Kosinski, in recognition of your num numerous achievements in professional road racing, including three AMA 250 Grand Prix championships, an FIM 250 World Championship, and an FIM World Superbike Championship, it is my great honor to induct you into the AMA Motorcycle Hall of Fame. First of all, thank you. Um, it's an honor to be here. I would like to um, take this chance to tell a, a short story that really, um, I would say, will lay the infrastructure on why I'm able to be here tonight to speak to everyone. Um, back in uh, <clears throat> 1982, my father and I loaded up my road race bike and, and headed to Daytona, Florida for the opening round of, of racing and of course I was just an amateur then but um, uh, the most important thing about being there was I had seen a, a Yamaha truck so I walked over to see sort of you know what kind of bikes were there and who was there and there was a, a Yamaha TZ 250 and it was painted in the traditional Yamaha yellow white and black colors the bike was absolutely stunning uh, but was, what was amazing was watching the, um, this fellow work on this bike. Um, I was just really sort of mesmerized by it. Um, so throughout the weekend, I just kept making trips back and forth to watch him. And, and at one point, I thought, wow, you know, the guy's probably going to throw me out or ask me why do I keep coming back. But um, <clears throat> eventually, he said hello. I introduced myself. <clears throat> and he said he was Bud Axelin. Um, when we left there, of course, I had won the amateur race, but I had a couple of things that were troubling. Uh, the first being, I didn't know, you know, how I would ever see him again and if I would ever see him again. Uh, just due to the fact that, you know, I lived far away and, and he, had, he was working for Yamaha, so it was, seemed like almost an impossible thing to ever happen. Um, three, years, three years later, I was doing some endurance racing for a, for a team, and the team owner said he had, had gotten a hold of a motorcycle from Yamaha, it was a TZ, and um, so they brought it to one of the endurance races, and I saw the bike, um, and the first moment I saw it, I recognized um, the exhaust pipes, <clears throat> and I said to him, I said, um, I'd like to, to race that bike. Uh, unfortunately, I just didn't tell him it was gonna be at a national level. So uh, I had gotten the bike from them, took it home, took, and as a 17-year-old kid, uh, disassembled this bike and put it together, and reassembled it, um, and just tried to check everything as well as I could with the amount of experience I had. And uh, we took the bike uh, to a first national at Mid-Ohio and um, I had finished fourth place there, but the biggest thing about that national was in the practice line, uh, when I was waiting to go out for practice, there was a fella in front of me. Um, he had the name Axlin on the back of his leather suit, and I thought, wow, you know, is that buddy? I don't think he races. So after the practice, I had wandered around until I found him, and I saw this skinny kid working on this bike, and immediately, introduce myself and and um, he said he was Chuck Axlin. So 
I had to ask him. I said, you wouldn't happen to know a butt accident, would you? And he said it was his dad. Um, of course, the second national outing uh, in Brainerd, Minnesota in 1985, I had won, won the national, and uh, it was a, a big accomplishment for me. And, and just knowing that, you know, the, the things that I thought were critical to have in 1982, you know, I, I guess I had part of it. I had the, sort of the bike, but of course Bud wasn't there. Uh, but that didn't stop me from believing, you know, one day I could hopefully, you know, arrive to a situation um, to be able to work with him. <clears throat> Um, in 19, um, during that year in 85, I had, I had made friends with Chuck and we uh, stayed in contact and the following year he invited me out to, to ride at his place um, and of course I jumped at that opportunity and went out there and, and, um, and while I was there, uh, Chuck actually uh, drove me to the ranch of Kenny Roberts, and and um, I'd met Kenny for the first time, and and at that point I just tried to sell myself to him and and tell him that you know basically just beg beg for some motorcycles to be able to race in '87, um, and um, um, lucky enough I guess he bought the sales pitch, and and I think he organized a team actually about three days before the race. And off we went in a box van, and actually Nobby Clark was supposed to be the, the, the chief mechanic for me. And down there we got a, we had gotten a call that he had some trouble with the visa and he wasn't gonna make it. And um, the next thing I know was, uh, it was a phone call and, and Bud Axel was on his way. Um, I, I couldn't believe it, it was like a dream. And um, I just remember walking up to the practice for the first round of qualifying, and you know, and it was like it was myself in those leathers. It wasn't Jimmy Felice, and um, you know, I was just I couldn't believe that everything that I <clears throat> wanted as you know at 12 years old was actually happening. Um, what led from there was basically three straight championships, which set us up for our greatest challenge. Um, and basically my whole racing career, and as well as one of my biggest accomplishments, which was the 250 World Championship. Um, but unfortunately, there were a few reasons why that was destined to fail. First thing, Yamaha was 0 for 3 in attempts to beat Honda. Um, the second reason would be um, it was the first time I'd ever ridden on Michelin tires, and those of us that have been there and have ridden had tried to make that transition from any other tire brand to Michelin know that you spend the first half of your career on the ground. Um, but, um, and the third and final thing, I'd never been to Europe, seen any of the racetracks, and it was, you know, it was, seemed like it was really impossible. So we started out and we just jabbed at them, you know, for the most of the season, and it was amazing that just past the halfway point, we had built up a big lead, and, and unfortunately, my inexperience with the Michelins and not having the right chassis set up, you know, I started crashing a few times, which set, really set us back. Um, I know that um, in England, um, I had crashed for like the third or fourth time, and of course, Kenny, he wasn't very happy, and, and uh, I'll just call it, he used a bit of ranch language. But, uh, but the amazing thing was um, when I'd gotten back to the motorhome, <clears throat> Bud Axon came down and just, you know, he said, you know, don't listen to any of those people. He said, just keep doing what you do best. And, it, <clears throat> and that he would make the bike better. So we carried on, and eventually we won the championship, and it was, it was really a, a highlight of my career and something that I'm very proud of. Um, and unfortunately, a month after winning that championship, 
I was in Japan at a meeting, and um, I had gotten some tragic news that Kenny was going to pull the plug on the whole 250 uh, program, and, um, and it was devastating because I wanted to go back a following year to try to win again, but also that I wouldn't be working with Bud Axon anymore. Um, it was um, probably a, <clears throat> a time in my life when I realized that uh, the racing, it changed for me and it became more like a job. But I just had to do what I felt, um, you know, Bud would be the most proud of and just soldier on. Twenty-one years later, in 2011, I had this idea to start. I wanted to do a project um, and build a two-stroke flat track bike. And of course, the first person that I called, um, because I knew the engine would need some attention, especially trying to compete against modern day technology, is I called uh, Bud. And the conversation was short and brief, but I was able to pull it pull the four words that I wanted to hear the most and he said send me an engine um, what has transpired uh, since that is over 40 short track wins a track record at Paris Raceway in Southern California as well as is my latest um, goal that I always wanted to do was be winning the Springfield short track You know, I can't really thank him enough for everything that he's done for me. But he's truly larger than life. Um, I'd like to thank the AMA for providing me a, a world-class federation that allowed me to hone my skills first as an amateur, then a professional, and of course, on to a world level. Uh, I'd like to thank everybody involved in putting this um, Hall of Fame together. It's, uh, from what I, it's just absolutely amazing, and I'm, I feel honored to be here. Um, I'd like to thank my family, uh, mom and dad, especially, you know, for driving all the miles and just supporting me. Um, as we all know, families typically take um, a real beating. Uh, going through this process, but it's all in fun, but, um, but it's still, they sacrifice a lot of things. I just want to thank them for that. Um, I'd like to thank uh, um, Chuck Axlin. Um, you know, I thought to myself, if the, gold, you know, the Golden Gate Bridge being an international landmark, uh, Chuck was definitely uh, my Golden Gate Bridge. Um, you know, he did a lot for me, and, and without him, I never would have made it to the dest destination that, that, I, that I always wanted. But for me, I just wanted to be with his dad. <laughs> and I knew with Bud that anything would be possible. <laughs> Sorry about that. I just, um, so anyway, in closing, like you said, we'd just like to thank everybody. Thank everybody here tonight for, um, being here to celebrate a special moment for not only myself, but my dad, um, all some people from Arkansas, Paul Covert, and especially my son, John. Thank you guys very much.